Hi there. In the previous segment, we talked about the first two components of the fourth property of a well-written text. That is mechanics. We've tackled capitalization and abbreviation in the first two segments of mechanics. Now, we shall proceed to the last component, but compared to the first two, punctuation will be the one with the most number of segments that I will make because this by far contains lots of rules with regard to using these special symbols in writing. Let's start with the most basic, the period. I noticed that some students still forget to use this when marking their sentences and some to my amazement are able to write a paragraph without dividing their paragraphs into different sentences so therefore they don't use any period at all now while that may seem easy to the reader it isn't so it's important to use punctuation marks like the period on the other hand it's quite commonly used even if it's not used by a few still it's the most common symbol used by writers let's review the four rules that govern its use the first one is the period is placed at the end of a declarative statement now when we say declarative it either conveys a fact or an opinion. As we can see in this example, a circle has 360 degrees. It's a fact because whatever your background is, you have to agree because it's proven. And the next one, I think I will pass English, is an opinion because there's no evidence that you will pass and second others can disagree with you second rule for using periods aside from declarative statements we may also use the period when marking imperative ones when we say imperative it either expresses a direction or a command so as you can see in the following examples the third rule we place the period at the end of an indirect question now what is an indirect question sir if you take a look at this sentence they asked what time the office would open usually we would express it like this what time would the office open Notice the change in order from what time would the office open to what time the office would open. What time the office would open is the indirect question here. Now, the nature of, indirect, of an indirect question is to further explain a certain question asked by another asker. Now the asker is not necessarily you. It can be another person whose question you are reporting. And to better report it, we use indirect question. We express the direction, sorry, the question indirectly. Instead of what time would the office open? Uh, they ask what time would the office open? That is the common error. People would sometimes place would elsewhere but this is the right order if you are reporting it as an indirect question okay fourth rule the period is placed at the end of most abbreviations so like jr datillo mrs mr doctor etc etc if the sentence ends with an abbreviation with a period, no need to add an extra period. 
let's say you place junior as the last word in your sentence and you abbreviate it even the period the default period placed after this abbreviation can serve as the period that marks the end of your entire sentence therefore you don't need to add an extra period after the one that's already beside junior no need to do that let's go now to the question mark by the way I'm no longer giving drills for using periods because it's so basic the use of such now I will just have to rely on your writing habits please use the period to mark your sentences whatever you're writing now let's go to the use of the question mark now this time we use this mark for questions that need a reply in addition aside from using it on wh questions there is another rule for using the question mark sometimes because we're in a hurry we tend to leave out the wh question like what which who and etc therefore the question attends uh, tends to appear like this four extra guests are coming for dinner instead of how many guests right the auditorium can hold only 50 people instead of could the auditorium hold 50 people they're expressed they appear to be declarative statements but they're expressed as questions yes we also use the question mark for these types aside from the question mark let's go to the exclamation mark now this time this mark is used to express strong emotions now the only rule that one must remember is to limit the use of such too many exclamatory marks may reduce effectiveness remember that do not be too emotional in your writing even if you're writing to convey your emotions do not use these uh, the the exclamation mark excessively otherwise readers may find your writing dull eventually because they'll be tired of seeing those exclamation marks a special rule to remember here is that exclamation marks can be used on interrogative sentences intended to convey intense feelings so you see these in books what a terrifying movie that was how nice of you to help me with my homework yes they start with wh questions right however the writers intend to express their intense feelings more than to get responses so that's the reason for using the exclamation mark on these interrogative sentences You may observe that in some books, the question mark and the exclamation point appear together. Yes, that's also okay. Now, if you're asking which is the correct order, according to Forlini 2005, I could not find special rule for that. However, just follow what is commonly used if you spot the question mark placed on the left while the exclamation point on the right then you follow that rule but to be safe if you are the writer and you want to emphasize the intensity of your emotions in your sentence then simply use the exclamation point no need to add any question mark now if you're emphasizing to get an answer remove the the exclamation mark and replace it with a question mark simple as that 
again, no more exercises for using question marks nor exclamation points because I want to rely on your, on your writing habits. Use these marks whenever they're appropriate. And another th thing, they're less frequently used. So I don't think you'd need to answer another interactive online exercise for that. But with the use of the comma, it's a different story. Okay, first rule. We use the comma before, not after, before the conjunctions for and nor but or yet. So, coordinating conjunctions. Now, we use the comma and the coordinating conjunction to separate two independent clauses in a compound sentence. Okay? Now, what is a compound sentence? A compound sentence is a sentence that has two independent clauses. Let's review briefly. An independent clause is a clause, a group of words that can stand on its own without any other modifier. Let's look at the first sentence. We saw many beautiful sights on our vacation. But we spent far too many hours on the road. The weather was pleasant, yet we still did not see all we had planned. Look at where the comma is placed. It's before the coordinating conjunction. And if you are typewriting or word processing, you add a space in between. Okay, that's the rule. Same goes for this one. If the conjunction simply joins two words, phrases, or subordinate clauses, no need to use the comma. Like mother and father, only two items, right? Now, mother and father is your compound subject. Prepositional phrases also follow this rule, as long as there are only two items around the lake up the trail, they are the prepositional phrases here. Subordinate clauses that were wet, that were just renovated. However, if it's three and above, that's the time you use the comma. And here's the catch. The number of commas should be one fewer than the number of items. So we have here a formula. If you have three items how many commas should you use so three minus one two if you're enumerating a series of words we have one two three four items we only use three commas as you can see here same goes for phrases and clauses so these are indirect questions. Notice the order, huh? Instead of who are the thieves, instead of when was the crime committed, where have the paintings been taken, we use these, this order. Who the thieves are, when the crime was committed, and where the paintings have been taken. Notice the difference between direct questions and indirect questions. When each of the items are joined to the next by a conjunction, omit, when we say omit, remove the commas. As you can see here, or is written twice. This is okay as long as it won't, I think, reach the third time. I think that's too much. But if it's just limited to two times, then it's fine. Same goes for other coordinating conjunctions. adjectives of equal rank uh, do you recall your elementary lessons on the order of adjectives you may google nonsense com you may just type order of adjectives and many results will come out based on the sources that i've seen 
there's no specific, there's no one size fits all formula for this. However, what's consistent is that the number, if it's one, if it's two, or several, it always comes first. Now, if you're not observing that order, that's the time you use the comma. Because, like in this sentence, swaying, majestic, graceful, these adjectives don't have any specific order or rank. If that's the case, we use commas to separate them. And what is more, as you can see here, no conjunction is used to separate the second to the last from the last adjective. We just write it directly as it is, no conjunction, but with commas because they are of equal rank. If there is a rank though, that's the time you omit the commas. Several long days, several long. So again, the number comes before the size. So since this is the case, they have an order, drop the comma. When you use introductory words like yes or oh or no, use the comma for, again, if you're introducing something. And I, I think you can name other introductory words. Prepositional phrases. Over the thickly wooded hills. You see these in books. So again, use the comma. Participial phrases. Running along the path. Studying for an exam. Etc. Infinitives. As long as you place them as an introductory word. Uh, or introductory phrase for uh, in this case. Introductory clause, adverbials. If you want to succeed in school, then you must study regularly. Parenthetical expressions. Now, what are parenthetical expressions? They need not be expressed, but because of another objective of yours, you want to write them down anyway. If you're addressing people directly and you want to voice out or write down their names, and their names are parenthetical, then you separate the main sentence from the parenthetical expression. In this case, Mr. Jones is the parenthetical expression, so it's set off with the use of the comma. And again, use add a space in between the punctuation and the item being set off. Conjunctive adverbs like therefore, however, if you place the conjunctive adverb in between, then you use two commas. But if it's placed last, just one. Common expressions. Of course, indeed. And other common expressions you can think of. If you're making a contrast, like in this sentence, our new car, not the station wagon, broke down. If you're conveying opposite ideas, you may use the comma. But if you want an added effect, you have to use another punctuation mark called the dash. The rule for such will be explained in another segment. But here, if you simply want to separate the parenthetical expression from the main sentence, just use the comma. Essential expressions don't need commas. Now, first of all, essential expressions are the ones that need to be written. If they're not written, the meaning of the sentence will change. Non-essential expressions are those that you need not write down, but because of maybe of your your want to remind your reader on something, you decide to write it down. So ex essential expressions are um Essential expressions can change the meaning of a sentence when removed, while non-essential expressions, they don't have any significant effect on the meaning of your message. 
Okay. Essential expressions in the positives, like in this sentence. When we say a positive, it's the expression that adds more information on the subject in your sentence. In this case, the subject here is the well-known author. And then the positive is Louisa May Alcott. This is essential, Louisa May Alcott, because if you omit this, people will wonder who is the well-known author you're speaking of. But if you state Louisa May Alcott directly, you need not put the well-known author, especially since the reader may, also, may already know whom you're referring to. Louisa May Alcott, there's only one Louisa May Alcott who lives in the orchard house as a child. She's the one and only. But if there's another woman who goes by the same name, exact same name, with exact spelling, then that's the time. Maybe you have to indicate which profession he or she, uh, she practices. Okay? Participial phrases with essential expressions. If we remove the, the underlined phrase, the piano is the one described in Little Woman. People will wonder which piano the writer is referring to. Now, it's not the piano in general. It's the piano now standing in the living room of Orchard House. Since it needs to be here it's considered essential, thus no comma. But in this sentence, piano is preceded by a possessive noun. So the reader already knows which piano is being referred to. Therefore, this phrase becomes non-essential. It can be removed without having to change the meaning of the entire sentence. But since the writer insists on writing it down anyway, we set it off with the use of the comma. Adjective clauses. Essential expressions. The man who led the tour of Orchard House knew much about it. Here, the underlined clause is essential because we don't know which man the writer is talking about unless he tells us he or she tells us but if the writer directly names Mr. Hoopin then this clause becomes non-essential because we already know which man the writer is referring to now were you able to digest essential and non-essential expressions if you still need to go back to the last um to the previous parts, feel free to do so. Since this is a lesson playlist, we follow your pace. Let's go now to the rule on geographical names made up of two or more parts. You may want to apply this when writing your addresses on application forms. We visited Rockport, Massachusetts last July. We will be having our vacation in Biga Silang, Cavite. Take note, the, these items are separated with the use of the comma. So always remember to do that. Okay? Dates. We separate the day from the month with number. This is how we set them off. Okay, and don't forget to place the last comma if the date is written at the start or in the middle of your sentence. But if it's written last, then just let it be placed beside the period. If it's a complete date like this, also use the comma. But if you're just putting the month and the year, it's optional. Again, you may decide not to put the comma if it's just the month and the year. Okay? 
And bonus lesson we use in for incomplete dates, not on. We only use on if you're putting the missing item here. But if it's just the month and the year, we use in. When a name is followed by one or more titles, use a comma after the name and after each title. Now, this is what this was given in the last segment on the use of abbreviations. Depending on the number of name extensions that the person has, that's that should also match the number of commas you're using. Like in this example, John Ruiz Jr. MD spoke about healthy living. Three names, three commas. But in this case, it's only three because MD is written in the middle of the sentence, not the last. Use a comma after each item in an address. Okay, when you should, when you're writing your address, you should separate the name of the, probably this is the name of the subdivision or um, usually in our country, we place the number, the block number, and the lot number first. Here, maybe it's the just a separate item. But let's assume that the, the address starts here. 14 North Main Street. So, comma, we separate street from. This probably should be the name of the city or suburb. I'm not sure. Not an American. Never lived there too. Oklahoma. But, take note, the zip code is not separated with a comma. That's the only exception. We only leave some space. When an address is written on an envelope, most of the time, commas are not used. Why? Because the way the address is written is like this. We leave each, uh, we skip to the next line when we finish writing the first item. As you can see here, street doesn't need a comma anymore because we put Ford Cobb, Oklahoma 73030 in the next line. Again, this is only for writing the address on an envelope. We use a comma after the salutation in a personal letter and after the closing in all letters. So I think this is self-explanatory. All of you have experienced writing formal or informal letters. Numbers with more than three digits. Remember this rule. You place the comma after every third digit from the right. We don't use commas in writing zip codes, telephone numbers, page numbers, serial numbers, years, or house numbers. These are the exceptions. Remember the following. Even if the page number reaches 1000, still we don't use any comma. If you're wondering why, I'll tell you it's, it is simply the practice in standard English. There are times when we write a sentence and then we don't want to repeat a certain word anymore. And not repeating it would make your writing concise, recalling one characteristic of effective language use, conciseness. We can do that through elliptical sentences. In this, in this sentence, the young woman radiated wealth, the young man poverty. In the next clause, we don't see radiated anymore. Instead, we see a comma that replaces it. Yes, it's fine to write your sentence this way. So you can use the comma to replace a word that you think should not be repeated anymore. Use commas to set off a direct quotation from the rest of a sentence. Always use a comma before you write the quotation okay but if you're replacing the quotation at the start you put a comma to replace the period and then 
followed by the last pair of quotation marks. And then, if you're using an interrupting expression like this, the boy continued, comma, and then opening quotations. Use a comma to prevent a sentence from being misunderstood. As you can see in the first sentence, whenever necessary explanations are included, it would be confusing what the prosody should be. Whenever necessary explanations are included, or is it whenever necessary, comma, ex explanations are included. As you can see in the second sentence, the comma acts like a pause marker. The reader knows when to pause. Unlike in the first one, the reader will assume, can assume, at least, that necessary and explanations should be read continuously without a pause. But that's not the case, so we need to put a comma in between. Same case, near the house Jack built, or is it near the house Jack built a tool shed? See, the comma prevents misunderstanding. To test your use of the comma, I want you to answer this exercise. I learned from my mistake. I know, I know. I will copy paste the link to the description below and you can simply click it. And again, the main reference I've used for mechanics is the one by Forlini, edited by Forlini, titled Prentice Hall Grammar and Composition. If you want, you can look for an updated version in the bookstore to verify the contents in this PowerPoint slide. So once again, thank you for viewing another lecture in this video series on mechanics. Stay tuned for the next one. Again, make sure you answer the exercises before proceeding to the next video. Bye-bye!